Well, I'm going to begin this morning's message with a little bit of a, a personal story of me when I was growing up. I remember when I was in the second grade, my teacher's name was Miss Hicks. She was a tiny little lady. Even then, I, I was seven, eight, I believe. But I even remember the first time I saw her, and I thought, wow, she's, she's a smaller lady. Very tiny, very short, um, just as sweet as she could be. But uh, she had this thing, it was called the chore chart. How many of you remember that when you were growing up? Some of you, maybe. I love the chore chart because, first of all, you know, it, you had all these different things that you could do. And it, uh, a lot of times it would allow you to kind of stay out of class a little bit longer. Like if you were the person that was wiping the lunchroom tables, then, you know, you were about five or ten minutes later coming back to class and you could kind of meander around. And I'm sure they knew what was going on. But they trusted us. They allowed us to do whatever the chores were at the time. And I remember up there... Uh, she had these little pockets, and there were all these chores uh, back when chalkboards were supreme. Y'all remember some of us had to go outside and clap those things together? And, you know, I'm still thinking that some of us are going to come down with some kind of sickness because of all that chalk dust that's in our lungs. But, you know, there, was, there were all types of things that you could be doing. But the one most coveted position out of all of them there was an envelope at the very top, and that was the class leader position. Now, in my class, in Miss Hicks' class in the second grade, the class leader was the person who was in charge of everybody else. Basically, what you were was a glorified tattletale. But I loved being the class leader because when you were the class leader, you were to make sure that everybody else was doing their jobs. You were trying to make sure that everything else was being done properly. Now, you had to be careful when you were class leader because if you weren't careful and you, you, you made somebody upset or you made them mad, when it became their time to be class leader, you know, there could be some, little, some vengeance taken out. So you had to be careful in that position. A lot of times the class leader, if the teacher ever left to go do something or she left the room for a minute, the class leader got to go up to the board and keep names on the corner of the board. You know, my name was always up there because I wasn't a bad kid, but I talked a whole lot. And I know that surprises y'all. But, uh, you know, you, you stand up there and your name's up there. You get a little check. You get a little check if you keep talking. I love the class leader position. And I remember when I did it because as a class leader, you were always at the front of the line. You were always put in charge of the class and all of the workers. And it was just great. It was so cool as a kid to have some authority. But, you know, I had limited authority. I couldn't walk up to the front of the classroom and just say, Okay, class, today turn to page 252 in your math book. I didn't have the authority to go up and be the teacher, right? I could only be the class leader, but I could only be the class leader because someone with authority, Miss Hicks, had given me the authority to be the class leader. But if you take it even further, Miss Hicks had authority because Mr. Griffin, our principal, had given her authority, right? He had hired her. But see, Mr. Griffin, our principal, he had authority because the school board had hired him to be the principal of the school. They had given him authority. So you see, there was this connection there. There was this wide array of authority that was put in place with each person. But again, you were limited to the authority in which you were given in that moment. Have you ever been given authority in your life? Maybe you were the supervisor at your job or maybe the head of the carpool. Or maybe you're a parent or a foster parent. But regardless, has there ever been a time in your life that you were ever placed into an authority position? Were you able to just go do whatever you wanted to do? No. You were given parameters, right? There were specific parameters that you had to work within. If you look in the dictionary, you look up the word authority, it says these are two definitions that really stuck out to me. The first one is the power or the right to give orders, to make decisions, or to enforce obedience. The second definition, a person or an organization having power or control in a particular, typically political or administrative sphere. Authority can only be given by someone who has the power to bestow it. Right? Right? When Pastor Terry hired my wife and I, 
back in 2017, he gave me the authority to pastor this congregation. With that authority came the expectation that I would do a few things. I would preach. I would check on you if I know you're sick. Back before COVID, I would visit people in the hospital. Anytime something breaks, we had one of our glasses out here break about two or three weeks ago. We had to get the whole thing replaced. Anytime something went wrong, I I was in charge. I'm still in charge of making sure that every single thing is being taken care of. But I don't have the power to just stroll up anywhere and exert my Trinity power. Does that make sense? Take, for instance, today, I'm the pastor of Trinity. I'm going to walk over to Pastor Tim and say, Pastor Tim, I bestow upon you the position of governor of the state of South Carolina. Go forth and do good things for the people of South Carolina. How do you like that? Is that going to work for me? No, because I don't have that kind of authority. It sounds good. I kind of felt a little powerful in the moment when I said it. But it doesn't stand true because there's no power behind my words. I don't work for the state government. I don't work for the federal government. I work for Trinity Church. My power is within Trinity Church. The expectation of the job that I am to do is within Trinity Church, right? Last week I told you when we were talking about the Easter story, so many times we love to place emphasis on the miracles that Jesus performed while he was on this earth, the things that he did, the, uh, the blinded eyes that he opened, raising people from the dead. But a lot of times we don't necessarily focus on his humanness. And when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, And he was praying just prior to his crucifixion. And he was saying, Father, please take this cup from me. But if not, not my will, but your will be done. We saw that human side of Jesus. But you see, Jesus was God made flesh. He had authority even here on earth. I told you last week that, uh, and I mentioned the exact scripture where it talks about Jesus says, I have been given authority, and it begins to specifically lay it out and what that entails. Standing on this stage today and preaching does not make me any more important in the kingdom of God than you. Have you ever stopped to consider the authority that you have been given from God? Have you ever stopped to think about the spiritual authority that has been given to you? Have you ever employed that authority? I was hired to be the pastor, the campus pastor of Trinity Church. But if I never walked up in here and did anything... Does my authority have any power if I'm not using it or if I'm not employing it? I want to talk to you today about authority. If you will, turn with me in the New Testament to Matthew chapter 28. And don't forget, if you have your church app, those notes are there for you. Matthew chapter 28, I'm going to be reading verses 16 through 20. And we heard some of this last week. Verse 16 says this, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and he told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Remember last week he talked about, I have the authority to call down thousands of angels to come and rescue me. He's stating once again the authority that he has. Verse 19, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Now, Let me put this scripture into perspective, just so that it doesn't come as some random scripture out of the Bible. We know that this particular scripture comes about after Jesus has died, has been resurrected, 
and is now is getting, he's getting ready to ascend into heaven. If you look at Acts 1-3, it tells us that after he was raised from the dead, he was still on this earth for another 40 days. This is what the Bible tells us. You can go find it in Acts 1-3. He was making himself known to the disciples. He was also visiting other folks, not in the way that we would visit them, but there were encounters that he would have with these people. He was proving that he had risen from the dead by his presence. Now, this particular scripture, this portion of scripture is known as the Great Commission because this is when Jesus is commissioning the disciples to do what he has called them to do, trained them to do, taught them to do for the past three and a half years. This is quite literally the moment that he has been preparing them for. Now, I want to focus for a second on verse 18. It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. The one with authority is now giving authority. Remember what we talked about a moment ago. I can't give Pastor Tim the authority to become the governor of South Carolina. I don't have that kind of authority. But here we find Jesus is in doing the disciples with authority in this moment. This isn't some random person coming up to them and telling them. This is Jesus. This is someone who holds authority, someone who welds authority, someone who can actually give them authority. If you look through Scripture, you will find different places where Jesus is giving authority to the disciples. And in each and every one of those sections of scriptures, you will find that each of them, though they don't contradict one another, we know that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all tell a lot of the same stories, but they give it from differing points of view. Okay? If you go to Mark 6, 7, it says this, And he called the twelve disciples together, and he began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. Now, if you look at Mark 3, verses 14 and 15, Then he appointed the twelve of them, called them his, or his apostles. They were to accompany him, and he would send them out to preach, and also to give them authority to cast out demons. Luke 9, verses 1 and 2 says this, One day Jesus called together his twelve disciples and gave them power and authority to cast out all the demons, heal all disease, and to send them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So not only is Jesus giving them authority, not only is Jesus instructing them, but he is calling them. With this authority, there is an expectation that they will do something, right? If I give, I'm going to use Pastor Tim again, if I give Pastor Tim the authority to do whatever it may be in this church, then he is expected in my mind, if I Ask him to do it. He agrees to do it. I expect there's an expectation that something's going to be done, right? Hello? Hello? Y'all staring at me like I'm crazy. Let me put this in terms we can all understand. When you tell your youngins to go clean their room, what do you expect them to do? Clean your room. Don't shove it under your bed. Don't stick it in your closet. Clean it up. I have authority, I am instructing you, and I have an expectation that you will do. What I, I just gave you the authority to clean your room, and I expect it to be done. Otherwise, I have leather on my side. What, uh, girl? Come on, somebody. Thank you, sister. Thank you, sister. <laughs> authority is not authority unless it is being used. And when Jesus began to give authority to the disciples, there was an expectation that it would be used to fulfill a very specific work. He gave us a specific job to do on this earth. And now we find that Jesus is commissioning the disciples, but inadvertently he is also commissioning us to do the same thing, right? It's a baby crying. We've all heard a baby cry. And a baby crying is the sign of a growing church. So I say, let it come on. We love them babies around here. 
Now, when you look at this same portion of Scripture in a different book, you'll find a little bit more information. We read a moment ago from Matthew 28, but now I want us to go to Luke 22, verses 44 through 49. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. So this is what I want you to hear. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all of these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with the power from heaven. Let me read verse 49 again. It says, and now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with the power from heaven. He had given them authority. But now, he is, in the words of Knight Rider, he is turbo-boosting that authority. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all ever watch Knight Rider? Turbo-boost kit, that car took off. That's what the Holy Spirit is in our lives. He was telling the disciples, wait here. I'm sending one to help you. I'm sending someone that will pair with you and with the authority that I have given you to do the job that I have called you to do. This is what's going on here. The Holy Spirit is now going to give validity to the message that we are spreading, to the job and the work that we are doing. Let me me explain this a little further. In a couple of years, help me Jesus, my daughter will be eligible to take the test to get her learner's permit. Father, help me. I'm a little scared. I'm not so much scared of that as I am of my son starting to drive. Help us, Lord. Y'all can pray about that tonight at our prayer meeting, 7 p.m. at the East Campus. (laughs) But in a little while, my daughter, who is now 13, she will go and she will take the test at the South Carolina DMV. One of the many DMVs throughout our state. And she will hopefully pass that test. After she has passed that test and she has had a little bit of practice and I I feel like she's ready to take the driver's test, she will go and she will take the driver's test as well. Now, after she gets done and she has now passed both of those, they will give her a little piece of plastic with her pretty little face on it that will give her the authority to drive a car. But guess what? She ain't got a car. Mom and dad will provide her with a car. But guess what else? That car don't work if you ain't working a job and making money to help pay for the insurance and the gas. As well as there's one important thing you're going to have to have to get that thing to run. a key okay now let's talk about this from a spiritual point of things Jesus gave us the authority to do specific things here on this earth but the Holy Spirit is the key to unlocking that authority the Holy Spirit is that key to empowering us to do what is before us to do because I can assure you that there have been times in my life where the Lord ha- or the Holy Spirit has prompted me to do something specific, and I'm like, <laughs> are you sure you want me to do that? Because I ain't had any training in that. I- I'm not quite sure how to do that. I was the same way when I strolled up in here and did my first sermon for the first time. Lord, are you sure? I'm almost five years into this thing, and sometimes I still stroll up here, and I'm like, God, are you still sure? Is this what you want me to We have been given an authority to do certain things on this earth. But a lot of times, we are getting caught up in the mess 
and the smoke screen that the enemy is throwing at us. If you look around us, there has been nothing but confusion for the past couple of years. The pandemic, everything that's been going on, marriages falling apart, people losing their minds over crazy stuff. People making documentaries about the man that had a baby. That's not possible. God made a man. God made a woman. You can go to the doctor and have you some surgery all you want to. But it ain't going to change what God put in place. That's not a pregnant man. That's a pregnant woman posing as a man. I'm not here to judge anyone for the decisions that they make. I'm going to love everybody that God sends into my path. But I refuse to walk this earth and to accept the mess that is going on down here without walking in the spiritual authority that God has given me to take control of some of these situations. You see, I might not be able to have the authority to come in your house and do anything specifically in your house, but I can loudly proclaim from 312 Meadow Saffron Drive that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I will speak that authority from my household because God has placed me in charge of that household. I have been given a specific amount of authority, but the authority only works if you work it. Get what I'm saying? Only works if you use it. God has given us authority, but as the church, we have become so lazy and so lulled to sleep by the different things that we are seeing on television. Many times things are being pushed on us, and if you're not paying attention, you'll just accept it like it's okay. But if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it's not godly. I can love the homosexual, but I cannot condone the sin. I can love the adulterer, but I cannot condone the sin. I can love the murderer, but I cannot condone the sin. Does that mean I'm going to sit in judgment of you? Oh, no, honey. I'm worried about the plank in my eye rather than the speck in yours. Or I should be. Right? Let's talk about the authority that we find out that comes from Scripture. Matthew 28, the one that we read earlier, the, the focus scripture that we have for today is just one example of that authority. We're told that we are given the authority to go and to make disciples. Remember, if you're given the authority, there's an expectation there that comes with it. To go and to make disciples. To baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To teach them the Word of God. That's what we're told in that scripture. If you go to John 1.12... We have been given the authority to share the gospel. We have the right to be called a child of God. That is our right. That is our connection. That is one more sign of the authority that we have as sons and daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you look at Hebrews 4.16, Hebrews 4.16 tells me that I don't have to, no offense to anybody, hear my heart I don't have to go to a priest and, 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 and turn uh, my sin. I don't have to talk about my sins with the priest. Hebrews 4.16 tells me that I can boldly approach the throne of God. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, and there we will receive His mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. I don't have to go to my wife and ask her for permission to go to the Lord in prayer. I can stroll up in the gates of heaven and say, God, I need you now. I need you in my situation. All hell's breaking loose around me. And you promised me that you would never leave me and forsake me. And I need you right now to enter into my situation. And I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood. Are you using the authority that you have today? Or are you sitting idly by, waiting on the enemy just to do his thing? I'm not going to allow somebody to stroll up in my house and rob me. Why? Because that's my house. I got a 357 that I will introduce you to. Now, I'm not, look, I, I'm not encouraging gun violence. But if you come up in my house without my permission, 
I'm going to protect me and mine. If you come up in my church, devil, and you start trying to mess with me and mine, you're going to have a fight on your hands. It's time for the people of God to stand up and to walk in the authority that he has given us instead of walking back, backing up, cowering away because the situation seems too small or too light or it's too heavy. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. If it's temptation, it's okay because his word says that he'll provide you a way of escape. In every single situation in your life, there's an answer in the word of God. But you can't walk in that authority if you don't know you have the authority. What are we doing, church? What are we doing? When somebody in my house gets sick, I'm not going to sit down and pray some little, now I lay me down to sleep or pray the Lord my son. I, that ain't going to work. Devil, you have no place in here right now. I plead the blood of Jesus. Your word says, by your stripes I am healed, and I am claiming that healing over my family right now. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I will not take it. I might have to watch it be formed. I might have to sit in the presence of mine enemies. But, Lord, you said that I would be the head and not the tail. Lord, you said that you would lead me and guide me. You would provide my every need. Maybe not my wants, but you said you would provide my needs. I don't have to walk around believing all this mess that the devil's telling me. Because I have authority. I have authority that I can walk in. But the authority is only as good if it's employed, if it's used. Ooh, I'm mad at the devil. The authority that you have comes from God. The next time your baby gets sick, don't call on my name. In the name of Pastor Brian Rhodes of Trinity Church West Campus, I command that this baby be healed. Don't you do it. There ain't no power in my name, but y'all, there's something about the name of Jesus. When you step into that situation and when you get to that place where you can't even pray anymore and you call on that name and you just speak it out into the atmosphere, something starts changing. Something starts moving. Why? Because there's power in that name. There's power in that name. Some of y'all have been walking around in your house bothered by the wars that you're fighting when what you need to do is go get you a can of spray Pam and go spray that house down, oil it up, pray over it. I don't care. Use you some Wesson cooking oil. If you ain't got nothing but Crisco, oil your hands up. That oil ain't got no power, but that's a symbol of the Holy Spirit's work in that house. People that are not Pentecostal, they might think I'm crazy, and that's okay. But I'm telling you, when something comes my way, I'm going to step into the authority that I have been given, and I'm going to take control of that thing. Why? Because I ha Ooh, somebody got it. Because I have it. Why would you let the power go to waste? And I need you to realize... You can't come in the power of Jennifer Rhodes or Ron Walters or Lisa Baj or anybody in here. But when you step into the situation and you call on the name of Jesus, his name has the power to change things. His power, his name has the power to, to set the atmosphere. To, too many times, and I've said this before, we walk into situations like a thermometer. We walk in, and if everybody else is acting a certain way, we allow ourselves to take on the temperature. But it's time for the people of God to be like the thermostat that's on that wall over there. And we're going to set the atmosphere when we come in. Not us, but the Spirit of God that is within us. When are we going to employ that authority? Is the devil fighting you today with a depression or anxiety? You've been given the authority to cast down those imaginations and anything else that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Do you need a healing in your body today? His word says, by your stripes you are healed. But if you don't call on them stripes, do you expect it to, it's not just going to, God's not going to push himself on you. He's a gentleman. He's waiting Lord, I love to call God to his word. If I find myself in a hard time or in a hard situation, I say, Lord, you said 
my kids use that against me all the time. But daddy, you said, I said, prove it. You got a video? Did I write it down? But y'all, we got the word of God. We don't have to put up with that mess. We don't have to deal with that junk. The spirit of God is the key to unlocking that change that can take place. We don't have to sit back and, 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 and take status quo any longer. My son has been dealing with that cyclical vomiting syndrome that I told you about for two years, but I'm still standing in faith that by God's stripes, he is healed. I know of people in this room that have just gotten over cancer, and guess what? I'm still proclaiming on your behalf. By his stripes, you are healed. There are marriages that may be struggling right now, and I will tell you that God can mend those things right back together. You see, he's a seamster. He has this thread where he can just sew it all right back together. It's not over till God says it's over. When are we going to use that authority? When are we going to stand up and get in the face of that bully and say, nope, not anymore. Not here. Not today or tomorrow or the day after. And the next week ain't looking good for you either. Sorry about your luck, devil. Pastor Tim, if you'll join me on stage. I'm stirred up this morning because I see the state of our world. And what's even more bothersome to me is that so many people of God are accepting defeat. Just because something doesn't turn out the way that you thought it would turn out, it doesn't mean that God is any less involved in it. The mess that we go through on this earth is not God's fault. He is not the author of confusion. The mess that we have to deal with down here is because of the sin nature that we were born into. It's because of a sin of eating a piece of fruit from a tree that they shouldn't have been touching. Adam and Eve, your great, 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 great grandparents from way back in the day. I don't care what your situation looks like because I'm here to tell you today that God is still in control. I don't care how sick you feel this morning. I'm here to tell you that God is still in control. I don't care if you woke up on the wrong side of the bed, if you are about to en endure some terrible hell this coming week. I don't know what's going to happen when you leave this place today. But regardless of what takes place, God is still in control. And not only that, you and you and you and you and me and you and you and you have the authority that he has bestowed upon you. Not to sit back and stare at the situation but to stand flat-footed and look that thing in the eye and say, nope, no more. His promises for you are yes and amen. You are his child. He loves you. And just like I want to bless my own children, you know, I learned a long time ago Bless their hearts. My kids are so hard-headed. I say they act like their mama, but everybody knows that's a lie. Sometimes I have to let them fall flat on their face. We were on vacation years ago. We had stopped halfway through our trip because the kids were really young, and we had decided to go out to the hotel pool, and my son was about three years old at the time, and y'all, he loved water. Was fearless around water. And I'm holding him, and he is, I mean, this is, wiggle worm was an understatement. I was about to drop him in the pool because he was so excited and so ready to be a part of it. And finally, I turned and I looked at my wife, and I said, turn around. 
I said, he's about to go under. I'm right here. I won't let him drown, but I need you to turn around. She looked at me like I was crazy. I said, turn around. She turned around. I let him go. Why? Was I trying to kill my child? No. But I had to let him fall before he would understand the dangers that would affect his life. 30 minutes later, he had forgotten that lesson. And I looked at Jennifer again. I said, turn around. This time she turned around the first time. And I said, bloop. It's three feet of water. It was right there beside him. Don't call DSS. A lot of times we will point fingers at God and say, God, how could you let this happen to me? God, why would you take this person out of my life? Why would you, why would you, why would you, why would you? God doesn't want to hurt you. But sometimes he's going to have to let you fall on your face and learn the lesson the hard way. Because some of you is hard-headed. Um, I can point one finger at y'all, but there's three more pointing back at me. All of that to say this. You don't have to stay in the situation that you're in right now. You have the key to unlock the authority that has been bestowed upon you. Use it. Use it. Use it. Bow your heads with me, if you will. God, I, I love you. I praise you. I magnify you. I proclaim today that there is none like you. Lord, I, I start this prayer by simply thanking you for never turning your back on me, even in moments that I turn my back on you. Lord, as crazy as it sounds, I want to thank you for those times that you let me fall flat on my face to learn those lessons that you had been trying to tell me all along, but I wouldn't listen to you, Holy Spirit. I had to do it my way. I had to have things my way. I want to thank you for always being faithful and never leaving me and never forsaking me. But Lord, today I am calling on your presence to sweep through this room and begin to empower your people to do the work that you have called them to do today. Lord, we don't have to walk around bound in chains of addiction. We don't have to walk around bound in chains of sickness. We don't have to walk around bound in chains of the devil's attacks. If we would simply step up, stand up, and walk in the authority that you have given us, things would change. Help us to be faithful with the authority that you have given us. Lord, not to turn against people and to judge them for the mistakes that they have made, but Lord, to love them and extend the same mercy and grace you've extended to us. But Lord, help us to walk in that authority, not looking back, not questioning the authority that you have placed on our lives, but to speak in power, to speak in truth, and to march forward knowing that you have already gone ahead of us. There is power in your name. Help us to speak that name until our dying breath. 